Hello again, everybody. I'm Robert Breaker. Welcome back. Today, we're going to have a Bible study on the Passover. That is today, April 8th, 2020. And today is the Passover. And I was praying about what to preach for Sunday, and I thought, well, the Passover. Might as well talk about the Passover. Um, Easter is coming up, and a lot of churches will have their Easter service. Well, I've done a video on Easter. Some people were asking me, Brother Breaker, are you going to do a video on Easter? And I'm like, I've kind of already done that. Um, but a lot of churches, well, they do an Easter service every single year. And there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, but you need to understand what Easter is and where Easter came from. Uh, the word Easter is from pagan origins. Um, Easter comes from Ishtar, or Ashtarte, which is Semiramis. And so I'm not really a fan of Easter, so to speak, or at least the word. Uh, but every year, Easter comes around the same time as the Passover. Usually it's within days of each other. And so um, if you want to know more about Easter, uh, go to YouTube and see my video entitled The Truth About Easter. And I'll show you more about that and how there's a lot of paganism in Easter. But what many Christians have done is they've taken the word Easter and they've taken it over and they say, well, we don't want to remember that. We don't want to remember the pagan bunnies and, and Easter eggs and you know things like that. We want to remember Jesus and the resurrection. Well, the Passover is when Jesus died. Then he rose again three days later. So you've got the Passover and then the resurrection. That all ties in with the gospel. So a lot of people, they want to remember Easter as rising from the dead, Jesus rising from the dead. And that's, I mean, I don't have a problem with that. That's wonderful to remember that Jesus rose from the dead. That's a great thing. I just don't like how a lot of the Christian um, holidays, if you will, or the, the things that Christians most remember, I don't like how they're tied in with paganism. And if you know history and you know the Bible, well, that all has to do with the system, the false religious system of Mystery Babylon, and how there was a certain church centered in Rome that uh, mixed paganism and the Roman state with Christianity. So you've got all this paganism and philosophy and, and Gnosticism all mixed in, and then they call that Christian. Well, I don't believe that church is Christian, that huge denomination centered in Rome. Um, I believe Christians are those that follow the Bible and what the Bible says. So I'm not going to get into Easter today. Um, instead, I'm going to get into the Passover. Now, I've talked about the Passover before. But I've never done a whole message on the Passover itself. And today, April 8th, 2020, is the Passover. So I thought, well, I'll go ahead and preach this today. And it will come out for our Sunday message. But by the time you see this, well, the Passover will have been over. But uh, I was thinking about this. And uh, some of you might have seen we're under this uh, COVID-19 threat, they're calling it. And... Um, a lot of people are, are told you have to stay in your homes and they can't leave their houses. Luckily here in Florida, uh, the, the governor gave an order where he says you can't leave except for, and he gave reasons, uh, if you have some sick family or loved ones, you can go visit them. Exercise. You are definitely allowed out of your house to exercise. Uh, go do other things if you need to. Um, so it's not a 24-7 lockdown like in some other places. So that's a blessing for us that we can still get out. And so I made a couple videos out swimming and one in the kayak. And I actually made a couple more, but you'll never see them. <laughs> I'm still learning how to use the GoPro. And boy, I got on my bicycle and rolled down the road and talked for 20 minutes. One of the most wonderful videos I ever did in my life, probably. Just talking off my heart. And the sound didn't work. So I'm sorry about that. But I was talking about the Passover. And how this year's Passover, 2020, it's so weird how it ties us straight back to the first Passover. And how there's a lot of the similarities in that. So... I don't know, maybe God didn't want me to get that out beforehand. Maybe God wanted me to do this sermon on the whiteboard for you to see. So we're going to do that today. We're going to talk about the Passover. Now, interesting thing, the word Passover is found 76 times in 71 verses in our King James Bible. I don't know if that means anything, but that's quite interesting. We are in the 71st year of the anniversary of Israel now. I just I don't know if that means anything, but that's quite interesting. So what we're going to do, we're going to look at the Passover and uh, what the Passover is. Let me write here what the Passover is. And I just have four points for you today. And I want to talk about the Passover and explain some things to you of what it is. And we're going to look at four points on what the Passover is. Now, if you know your Bible, 
you know when the Passover is and everything like that. So I'll, I'll draw it up here as well, kind of so we can get an idea in the Bible of when the Passover is and where we are in our current timeline. I like to draw this up um, most of the time, this timeline, so you can get an idea of where we are historically in the Bible. And we can understand that. So here we are today in the church age. And we are waiting for the rapture. And that's what we're waiting for. And boy, I can't wait for it to come. I'm not the only one. There's a lot of other Christians out there too that say, Brother Breaker, I just cannot wait for Jesus to show up and take us out of here. And I say, Amen. <laughs> Amen to that. So the first thing I want to say about this Passover, a lot of times when you talk about the Passover, it, it's sad. Uh, when I was a kid, most, most people knew the Bible. They may not have read it, but they'd been to church at least once or twice in their life. And they'd heard about the Passover. And you talk to somebody, hey, remember the Old Testament Passover and Moses? And, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But in the last several generations, and I'm 45, so I guess I'm once removed from the last generation, maybe twice. I don't know how that works. But there's a lot of people that are raised in this world that don't have a Bible. And they don't know anything about the Scripture. So when you talk about the Passover, they go, what is that? They don't know. So this is a message that to some people might be remedial. Oh, I know all about that. Well, okay, okay, but I, I want to remind you. And by the way, I want you to hold in to the very end of this message because I'm going to throw some stuff on you at the end of this message that I hope will be a blessing to you. But there are other people out there that have no idea what the Passover is or where it is or where it's found in the Bible. So I, I want to give this message to both, those that know, those that don't know. I want you both to learn. And uh, you can always learn something. And sometimes the best way to learn is repetition, repetition, repetition. So if you already know this, please bear with me and, 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 and hear it again. And I'm hoping you'll share this with other people. So the first thing I want to say about the Passover, it was a real historical event. Some people, they look at the Bible and they think the Bible is like mythology. <laughs> And they say, oh, the Bible's just a bunch of old stories written by people. Ha, ha, ha. You know, oh, that's funny, like Aesop's fables or, or mythology. No, it's not. The Bible is a historical book that talks about real historical events, things that literally happened in history. And if you read your Bible, you will see that historically, this is a thing that took place in history. And it took place about right here. And this is where the Passover took place. Now, it's a historical event. And I'm going to read you some passages uh, today. We're going to go long, reading a lot of verses, but I want you to read it with me. So let's go to Exodus chapter 12. Now, kind of give you the context. The children of Israel, God's chosen people, were in Egypt in bondage to the Egyptians. Why? Because of the sin of their fathers. And because of their sin, God judged them by allowing them to become servants becoming in bondage. They were slaves, actually, because the Bible says in the book of Exodus they were in bondage, if you will. Well, if you're in bondage, you're a slave. So they were enslaved to Egypt. Now, Egypt is a type of the world in the Bible, but Egypt is also uh, one of the biggest um, nations during that time, the most powerful, and Pharaoh uh, wanted the children of Israel to serve him. And he was afraid of them because there were so many of them. And so he put them in bondage and made them serve with rigor, it says, rigorously. Well, that sounds like a slave to me. They, they served hard, and they worked hard as slaves in Israel, in bondage. Well, God said, I, all right, I've had enough. Now it's time for you to get out. And God brought the ten plagues upon Egypt in order to... Uh, to kind of show Egypt who's in charge. Because old Pharaoh was like, I'm the most powerful in the world. It's all about me. And God in heaven goes, no, no, buddy, it's not about you. I'm the one in charge. So he sent these ten plagues with Moses. And then on, toward the end, after all those plagues, God says, okay, this will be the last one, the last of the plagues, which will be the death of the firstborn. And here's what you're going to do. We're going to have what's called the Passover. So let's just read here uh, verse 1 through 14 in Exodus chapter 12. So go to Exodus chapter 12, and let's read about what historically God said to Israel and what took place. Exodus chapter 12 and verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month, they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for a house. 
And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it according to the number of the souls. Every man according to his eating shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats. And you shall keep it up until the fourteenth day of the same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. Verse 7, And they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door posts of the houses wherein they shall eat. And they shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire and unleavened bread, and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. Eat not of it raw, nor sodden at all with water, but roast with fire his head and his legs, and with the pertinence thereof. And ye shall let nothing of it remain until the morning. And that which remaineth of it until the morning ye shall burn with fire. And thus shall you eat it, with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. Now, why would they have to eat it with their shoes on and their staff? Well, if you know the Bible, it's all preparation for the exodus, which is leaving Egypt and getting away from the sinful, wicked people that had them in bondage. Ooh, I'm getting goosebumps because I know what this is a type of, amen? But anyway, it goes there in verse 12. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night. Who is speaking here? God. And will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where ye are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. So that's where we get the word Passover from. God says, I will pass over you if I see the blood that they put on the door. And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. So that's a plague. It was a plague of the death of, of the firstborn. And God said, but that plague won't touch you. It's all because of the blood. And this day shall be unto you for a memorial, and you shall keep it a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. You shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. So what do we have here? We have a real historical event that took place uh, with a people, a people known as Israel. A people that were in bondage to a foreign nation. and They were in Egypt. And God says, now listen, this is what I want you to do. And they did it. And by doing that, they were saved through the Passover. They had to put the blood up. If they didn't put it up, then they weren't passed over and they would have had their firstborn die. So there was something they had to do. But yet it was the blood that saves them. Now today we're not saved by what we do. We're saved by the blood because Jesus did it already by putting his own blood up on the cross of Calvary. So it's not by works that we're saved, thank God. But there was an element back there of, hey, you had to do this. You had to put this on your door because... If you see the blood, you'll pass over. But if you didn't put it there, <laughs> uh-oh. Well, thank God today salvation isn't by what we do. We're trusting in what Jesus did. But this is a real historical event. And by what I saw and what I read, it took place about 1491 B.C. So let's just round that to about 1500. Well, here we are over here, and there's been about 2,000 years from Jesus. And then from Jesus back almost... Uh, 1500, that'd be about 3,500 years ago. So about 3,500, I'll say more or less, about 3,500 years ago. That's a long time ago, 3,500 years. But that's more or less when this happened, about 3,500, almost 3,500 years ago. And it's a real historical event of something that took place in which God, the creator of the universe, told a certain people, now do this, and then when I see the blood, I'll pass over you. And God judged the enemies of the people of God. And then later, he allowed them to leave. Now let's go ahead and read verse 21 through 29. I want you to, to, to get an idea of what the Bible actually says about this. So let's go to verse 21. Then Moses called for all the elders of Israel and said unto them, Draw out and take you a lamb according to your families and kill the Passover. And you shall take a bunch of hyssop. Hyssop is some sort of a plant. And dip it in the blood that is in the basin. So it, taking this, and it's almost like making it into a paintbrush. And strike the lintel and the two side posts with the blood that is in the basin, and none of you shall go out of the door of his house until the morning. So they're told to shelter and place. They're told to stay in their homes. 
For the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians, and when he seeth the blood upon the lintel and on the two side posts, the Lord will pass over the door, and will not suffer the destroyer. Who is that? Well, that's the destroying angel. To come in unto your houses to smite you. And ye shall observe this thing for an ordinance to thee and to thy sons forever. Now let's read on down to verse 29. I'm in verse 25 right now. And it shall come to pass, when ye be come to the land which the Lord will give you, according as he hath promised, that ye should keep this service. And it shall come to pass, when your children shall say unto you, What mean ye by this service? That ye shall say, It is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover, who passed over the houses of the children of Israel in Egypt, when he smote the Egyptians and delivered our houses. And the people bowed the head and worshipped. And the children of Israel went away and did as the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron. So did they. They did something. You know, something they had to do. They had to put that blood up. In verse 29, And it came to pass that at midnight the Lord smote all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh that sat on his throne, unto the firstborn of the captive that was in the dungeon, and all the firstborn of cattle. And what happened? Well, verse 30, there was, uh, there was crying. There was a great cry. It says that there was not a house where there was not one dead. Except in Israel, where they did what God said. So, the Bible there tells us about what happened. What happened was, they lived in the houses, and they were given a shelter-in-place order, <laughs> if you will. And if you knew what it was like in the Old Testament, and you go to an Old Testament house, uh, they were kind of made of adobe, so to speak, but they'd always had a big beam of wood here, here, and here, and this was the door to go into the house. And what Moses t told them, or what God told them through Moses, is what God said is, I want you to take that hyssop and use it like a paintbrush, and take that lamb and put the blood up here, and then on the sides over here. So there were three different places that they had to put that blood on the door. You know what that's a picture of? Just imagine the guy's doing that and he's dipping it and he puts it up here. I imagine there were some droplets dropping down, down here a little bit. And then he went like this and he put some on this side and some on that side. Why? That's a cross. <laughs> wow, isn't that something? And that makes a cross right there. So there you have the Old Testament, real historical event, something that is really, truly true. Not some made-up myth of, of some book of, oh, this is a story. This is a real historical event of something that really took place about 3,500 years ago. And it was saved by blood. They had to do that, and when they did it, here comes the angel, and he says, oh, all right, I'm not going to touch that house. Everyone in there is saved because I see the blood. And I will pass over. And that's where we get the word Passover from. And it's in the Bible. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. It's an old hymn we have in, in many churches. When I see the blood, when I see the blood, when I see the blood, I will pass, I will pass over you. And it's the Passover song that we that are Christians sing about something that was for Jews. Now, every year, Jews celebrate this still. And uh, so let me write that up here. What else is this Passover? Not only was it a historical event, it became a feast that God told Israel they had to remember and keep and do every year. Now, I don't believe they had to put blood on their door every year, but they had to do the other part every year, which meant they had a certain supper. And they all got together and they ate. And we call that the Passover meal. And for the last 3,500 years, the Jews have been doing that. Now, briefly, um, in the book of Judges, they forgot. And I was reading that here not too long ago. There was a time period where they kind of forgot. But then they got back to it. and they So imagine the thousands and thousands and thousands of Passover feasts that they've kept. Close to 3,000 at least. I don't know how many years it was that they forgot. But Jews have been doing this every year, having a Passover feast. So the Passover became not only a historical event that took place about 3,500 years ago, it became a ritual for the children of Israel. So the children of Israel said, we're going to do this every year to remember what took place upon that day that this took place in Egypt. So let's read that. Let's go to... Exodus 12 and verse 14. Exodus 12, 14. 
And this day shall be unto you for a memorial, and ye shall keep it a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. Ye shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. So it's a feast. It's a ritual. It's something they have to do, but it's also a feast. So it's a great excuse every year for Jews to get together and eat. <laughs> and remember something. Remember that the great God saved them one time a long time ago. And what I'm going to show you is it points to today how God can still save Jews and Gentiles. And it has to do with the blood. So it's a blood reminder of salvation through blood. Now, let's go to Leviticus 23 and then Numbers 9. So Leviticus chapter 23. So this was a historical event that took place one time in history. But then God says, now I want this to take place every year thereafter. And it was supposed to. Now the Jews forgot some years, but then they didn't forget anymore after that. And they've been doing it ever since. Even to this day, if you're a Jew, if you're uh, so someone that claims descendants of Israel, you meet every year and have a Passover meal. I think it's called the Cedar, S-E-D-E-R, the Seder. I don't know how they say it. But uh, Leviticus chapter 23, verse 4. These are the feasts of the Lord, even holy convocations, which ye shall proclaim in their seasons. In the fourteenth day of the first month, even at even, is the Lord's Passover, it says. And then verse 6. And on the fifteenth day of the self of the same month is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Unto the Lord seven days you must eat unleavened bread. So you've got the Feast of Passover, and it's tied in with the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Now, let's go to Numbers chapter 9. Numbers chapter 9. And in Numbers chapter 9, verse 1, And the Lord spake unto Moses in the wilderness of Sinai, in the first month of the second year after they were come up out of the land of Egypt, saying, Let the children of Israel also keep the Passover at his appointed season. In the fourteenth day of this month at even, you shall keep it in his appointed season according to all the rites of it. So there's some rites involved. It's a ritual. A ritual is what you do some rites. So there's all these things that had to be done during this Passover. And that's what they did. According to the rites of it and according to all the ceremonies thereof shall ye keep it. And Moses spake unto the children of Israel that they should keep the Passover. And they kept the Passover on the fourteenth day of the first month and even in the wilderness of Sinai. According to all that the Lord commanded Moses, so did the children of Israel. So verse 3 says the rites. So if there were some rites involved, then it was a ritual. And it's a feast. Now, I've actually been to a Passover feast in my life. Uh, many years ago, when I was a younger man... I had a girlfriend in, uh, well, close to Detroit, uh, Wayne County, a little bit outside of Detroit, Garden City area. And I was on deputation. I would go and I would preach in different churches, raising support to be a missionary to Honduras. And when I could, I would go back and visit her. And uh, we were supposed to be married and everything. And I won't get into all that. Uh, she spoke perfect Spanish, which I thought was great. And uh, she told me she had some friends that were Jews and they were having their Passover feast. And she was invited. And I said, honey, I'd, I'd love to go. <laughs> And she said, well, you're invited too. I said, "Woo!" I was excited about it. So I drove up to Michigan and we went to the Passover feast. And it was pretty amazing to see what were the actual rites or rituals of what they did during this feast. And you know what was the most amazing thing? As a Christian watching this, I saw Jesus Christ all the way through it. But they didn't see it. The Jews didn't see it. It's kind of a funny story. I was in Bible school and I graduated Bible school. And uh, when I was in Bible school, I had a year of Hebrew, so I studied the Hebrew language. So we were there at their uh, Jewish Passover feast, and they gave everyone a book. And the book had English on one side and Hebrew on the other. And so th they went around the table, and everybody read their part. And when they came to me, I said, do you guys mind if I read in Hebrew? And they said, sure. And I said, okay. And, and I did what I thought was great, because, I mean, I could pronounce it very well, I thought. And I was excited, and I read the whole thing, and I got done, and I was just smiling, like, how'd I do? And they go, would you please read in English next time? And I was just like, oh, I felt like that. I, I guess I didn't do a very good pronunciation. But uh, <laughs> I tried, okay? I tried, and it was kind of funny. It just The way they looked at me, and they were trying to be so nice. Would you please read in English next time? Okay, all right, I take the hint. I take the hint. So I read in English the next time. But they would go, and they had these different things that they did that just pointed to Jesus Christ so openly and blatantly. And it's just like, wow, that's Jesus. And they couldn't see it. 
they couldn't see it. And it was just incredible to, to me. I don't know if you get a chance, maybe someone has on YouTube some videos about what they do during a, a Passover feast. Maybe if you have time, check that out. One thing I remember is they had three pieces of crackers. And they took the one in the middle, they, they put them like a sandwich, and they took the cracker in the middle, they broke it, then they went and hid a part of it, and then they put it back together. And then later they found it and put it back. And I was like, is that the Trinity? Is that the Godhead, Father, Son, Holy Spirit? And the Son was broken, Jesus Christ was broken, and the Jews rejected their Messiah, but someday they'll find him again. And it was just knowing the New Testament, knowing the Bible, and looking at what they're doing, I was just like, there's Jesus everywhere in this. How do you guys not see that Jesus is the Messiah? Well, they don't. They don't. And so uh, it was quite an amazing thing for me to be a part of that, to see that. And, of course, that's what Paul says. Paul says in Romans 11 that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles become. So Israel as a nation doesn't see Jesus as the Messiah yet, but I believe they will. And they've been doing this thing for almost 3,500 years. And, boy, it's all going to be clear to them one day when Moses and Elijah show up, the two witnesses. In the book of Revelation, the two witnesses show up. And they talk about who Jesus is, and they witness to Israel, and they say, hey, Jesus is the Messiah. And then they're going to start to see it. And this is something I found was very, very interesting. While I was there in Michigan at that Passover feast, um, when the lady of the house, she took some wine, and they were drinking wine, and I was like, no, thank you, I'll, I'll have grape juice or, or water. I didn't want their fermented wine. But uh, they, they, the lady took some fermented wine and poured it in a cup. And she said, now I'll be right back. And she left. Now, I was there looking at all these Jews, and they knew what was going on. They'd been doing this their whole life. And I said, can I ask what she's doing? They said, oh, sure, sure, yeah, we love to explain it. And so I, I asked a lot of questions, and I was, I was enjoying learning. And they said, well, what we're doing now is she's filling a glass, and it says, is it Malachi? I believe it's Malachi, the last book of the Bible. It talks about how God will send Elijah again. And so she was taking this cup of wine. She went to the front door, opened the front door, put it down on the front step, and closed the door and came back. I said, now what is that? And they said, that was the cup for Elijah. You see, the Jews believe the Old Testament. And they believe that Elijah will return to Israel someday. Well, if you have a New Testament, you've got the book of Revelation that says, yeah, yeah, Moses and Elijah are coming back as the two witnesses. There's no doubt that's who they are. Matter of fact, read Matthew 17 sometime. There they are, Moses and Elijah. But anyway, I thought that was amazing that they put the... And I'm thinking to myself, wow, if you were a, a drunk or a wino, just learn when the day is and then you could have a good time going door to door drinking up all that wine. <laughs> I just, I had a thought about that. I said, does it ever get drunk? And they go, no. I go, okay, I just want to make sure. But uh, they really believe that Elijah will return someday. And they're putting that out there for Elijah. Well, I hope Elijah doesn't drink it because, boy, he'd be drunk, wouldn't he? But anyway, this, this was what they called the cedar, S-E-D-E-R, the feast. I believe that's how you spell it, S-E-D-E-R. And it's the, the Passover feast. Now, they don't put the blood on their doorpost anymore. And I found that very interesting, but, that they leave out the blood. Hmm, isn't that interesting? They leave out the blood. Kind of like your modernist so-called Christians. They preach a bloodless gospel today. They leave out the blood. Not this guy. No, I'm going to make sure I preach the blood because it was pass over you. It was saved through the blood. And today, salvation is through faith in the blood. Romans 3.25. I want to make sure I never forget the blood of Christ. And so I was looking forward to this message because it's a great opportunity to preach about the blood of Jesus. So this is their feast, the feast of the Passover. Now, the third thing I want to say about the Passover is it reminds us of something. It reminds us of death. Or dying. Let's just say dying. And then I'll put death. It reminds us of death. During the Passover, there was some judgment going on. This was God's judgment upon all the world at that time, all of Egypt. And God says, look, you do that, and then when I see the blood, then you're saved. If you don't have any blood, then you're not saved. And there was some death. There was some dying going on. So let's go back to um, Exodus chapter 12 and look at verse 12 and 13. God says, For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night and will smite all the firstborn of the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. 
See, this was more than just Egypt against Israel. This was the great God of heaven against the false gods of Egypt. And their faith was in their own gods. And God says, no, I'm the only true God. So there was a lot more going on than just one nation against another, so to speak. This was a spiritual battle thing going on here. Against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where ye are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. Now look at verse 29 and 30. And it came to pass that at midnight the Lord smote all, smote all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh that sat on his throne, unto the firstborn of the captive that was in the dungeon, and all the firstborn of cattle. And Pharaoh rose up in the night, he and all his servants, with all the Egyptians, and there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house where there was not one dead. Well, that's really sad. I mean, I, I can't say it any other way. That's a th sad thing. I don't like death. I don't like to see people die. I think that's awful. But here you had mass death. And there wasn't a family that didn't see death that was worshiping false gods. Boy, this ought to be a lesson. Never, ever worship a false god. Always worship the true God of heaven. Amen? But this is the lesson, and it reminds us of death. Judgment was dished out. Well, you know what? We're all going to die someday. We're all going to pass over to the other side. Have you ever thought of that? Everybody dies. Why do we die? Well, I talked about that here a couple weeks ago in my message about the, the worst virus there ever has been or ever will be. It's called death. It's got a 100% mortality rate. Everybody's going to die. So what's the cure? What's the answer for death? Blood? Blood transfusion. Trusting in the blood of Jesus because it's the blood of Christ that gives us eternal life. So I, I find this interesting, this story of the Passover, because it reminds us about death and victory over death. How to find victory over death. But when we study this, we need to think about this. Everybody dies. What's going to happen when you die? Will you pass over? Yeah, everybody dies. Now, what's on the other side? A lot of people say, oh, we don't know. We'll never know. No, we know. The Bible clearly tells us what happens. When you die, your soul leaves your body and goes either up or down. One of the two. And it's all based upon whether or not you have the blood. If you're saved by faith in the blood of Jesus Christ, the gospel, how that Christ died for our sins, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, he shed his blood. And through faith in his blood, trusting in the blood of Jesus, why when you die, you go to heaven. But if you're not saved when you die, you pass over to the other side at death, and you go whoosh, straight down. And I don't want to see anybody go there. I don't want to see anybody go to H-E double hockey sticks, if you will. I don't want to see anybody go to hell. That's why God's called me to be a minister of the gospel and to preach the gospel and preach salvation. What is the gospel? The gospel is 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4. And it's all about what someone did for us to save us. And it all has to do with blood. Shed blood. And it's salvation is based upon the blood that was shed for us. Whose blood was that? Well, that was Jesus' blood. Now, if you know my ministry and you know my videos, you know I talk about the gospel a lot. And it's only the gospel that can save us. That's why I preach the gospel. I want, to, I want you to know, someday you're going to pass over. Some way, someday you're going to die. But if you want salvation, if you want heaven rather than the other place, you've got to come through the blood. It's the blood of Jesus Christ. And that brings me to the next point. A lot more I could say on that, but let's look at the next point. The Passover points to Christ. And Jesus is the redemption, redemption for sin. The redemption for sin is Jesus. Jesus Christ is the only way to find forgiveness. And who is Jesus? Watch this. Jesus is the Passover lamb. The Bible says, Behold the lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. When Jesus showed up, first thing that was said about him when he started his earthly ministry was, hey, he's the lamb. Now, why is that important? Well, in the Old Testament, they had to sacrifice a lamb. So it was the lamb's blood. So they took this old lamb, and, and please excuse me, I'm not a good artist. <laughs> i got a little stick figure lamb here. And they took that lamb, 
under that Old Testament Passover, and they cut its throat and they killed it, and all the blood came out. And there was just a pool of blood, and that's when they took the hyssop, if you will, which, which like I said, it kind of kind of came out like a like a paintbrush, if you will, with a handle, and they put that blood in that, and they dipped it, and then they put it on the wall. So it was all having to do with the blood of a lamb that Israel was saved back then, about 3,500 years ago, in the Passover. Well, up shows Jesus Christ, and in John chapter 1, it tells us, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. So Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God. He is the Lamb of God. Now, watch what else it says about Jesus Christ. Wait, 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 well, let's back up, let's back up. Go back to Exodus chapter 12 real quick. Exodus chapter 12 and verse 24. Exodus 12, 24 says, And you shall observe this thing for an ordinance to thee and to thy sons forever. So it has to be a ritual, something that's done every year. Okay? Talking about the Passover. Verse 25, It shall come to pass, when ye shall be come to the land which the Lord will give you, according as he hath promised, that he shall keep this service. Well, what is that? Well, here's what that is. It's called the Exodus. And the exodus came after the Passover. And the exodus was when God let them free. And they left Egypt. And they went to the promised land. Well, today, the promised land is heaven. <laughs> and we today, we're waiting for the rapture. And that will be our exodus, we who are saved. So that's going to be awesome. I'll talk more about the exodus here in a minute. But go back to that uh, chapter there in uh, Exodus 12. And look what it says in verse 25. Um, and it shall come to pass when ye be come to the land which the Lord will give you, according as he hath promised, that ye shall keep this service. And it shall come to pass when your children shall say unto you, What mean ye by this service? So he says, Whenever the people uh, that are descendants of those that went through the actual event say, What's this all about? Why are we doing this? Why are we doing this Passover thing? What is it? What's it mean? Look at what God says in verse 27. That ye shall say, it is the sacrifice. Whoo, I'm getting goosebumps. It is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover who passed over the houses of the children of Israel in Egypt when he smote the Egyptians and delivered our houses and the people bowed the head and worshipped. So what is God saying? He's saying that lamb was a sacrifice. And that blood of that lamb was the, was what was save you. And so it was the blood saves. Saved by blood. A blood sacrifice. That was the Passover lamb. Well, look at Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the sacrifice for our sins. And it's his sacrifice that saves so we're saved by the sacrifice of Jesus, the Lamb of God, which came about, what, uh, 1,500 years later. So let's go to uh, 1 Corinthians 5, 7. Quite interesting. The Bible says that when they killed that lamb back then during the Passover, that that lamb was a sacrifice. It was a sacrifice for them. What is that? That's what you call foreshadowing. That's what you call prophecy. That's pointing to a future sacrifice that will save through blood. And that's the sacrifice of who? 1 Corinthians 5.7, I'll tell you who. Paul, our apostle, tells us. 1 Corinthians 5.7 says, Purge out therefore the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, as you are unleavened. For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Christ our Passover. Who is he talking about? Jesus. So Jesus, according to Paul, is our Passover lamb. So Jesus Christ is the sacrifice that saves today. You can't go out to your house right now and kill a lamb and put blood on the doorpost and go, Okay, God, now save me. That won't work anymore. That was then. And God said, I want that done, and I want them to do that every year. At least think about it every year. I want them to have the feast every year, but I want them to think about what really took place back then. Because someday I'm going to be the lamb. I'm going to sacrifice myself for the sins of the world. And I'm going to die for their sins. I don't have time to go back, but in Numbers chapter 9, and verse 12, 
uh, Moses is giving some of the rules for the Passover. And he says, when you kill that lamb, you don't break any bones. When you read the New Testament, when Jesus died on the cross, not a bone was broken. Jesus is the Passover lamb. He's the type of that Old Testament lamb. All right, if that's the type, then what does that mean? That means that blood saved then, this blood saves now. And the Bible, go to Colossians 1.14. The Bible tells us about Jesus. And Jesus Christ is the sacrifice for the sins of the world. He is our Passover lamb. And his blood shed on that cross, on that old rugged tree, that's the blood that saves today. It's Jesus' blood. His sacrifice for our sins. And that's how we're passed over today. When we have to die and pass over to the other side, will God see the blood? You see, when you're saved, the Bible says you're washed in the blood of Jesus. And as soon as you're dying, your soul leaves. God in heaven looks down and says, okay, that's a blood-washed sinner. That means he's saved. That means he's trusted in my blood. All right, come on up. And you go to heaven, not based upon your works, not based upon what you do, based upon whether or not you have that blood applied to your soul. Go to Colossians 1.14. So the Passover to me means a lot. I love the Passover. I love every year when the Passover comes. I think it's great to remember that blood sacrifice and what it's a type of, the type of the Messiah. He says Christ. Who is Jesus? Jesus Christ. He's the Christ. You know what that means if you're a Jew? Christ is the Messiah. You may or may not know this, but Jesus Christ is your Messiah if you're a Jew. And you need to understand that, you need to see that, you need to believe that. And I don't see how you can't believe it if you simply read the New Testament about Jesus and who he was and what he did when he came, and now he's coming back. He's coming back. And even Elijah is going to tell you that when he shows up. If you're a Jew, you need to see Jesus as your Messiah. Colossians 1.14, speaking of Jesus Christ, says, In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Jesus Christ is the for redemption for our sins. And it's through the blood of Jesus that we are redeemed, that we are forgiven. If you want forgiveness, you can't find it in anything else other than Jesus' blood. It's forgiveness of sins. You see, there's a lot of religions in the world. And these religions all want to talk about how to get your sins forgiven. And they all have something in common. They all tell you, if you'll do this, or if you'll do that. And they tell you a system of works. And they'll say, if you do these works enough, then God will go, okay, I'm happy with you. I accept you. That's not how it works. That's not how it worked back then. It's not how it works today. The only way to be saved is through the blood. Are you saved? Are you washed in the blood? Now that's it. That's my message. Now, this is what I wanted to give you at the end of this message. And I hope it's a blessing to you. We are very close to what I believe will be the rapture soon. I think we are so close. I'm thinking this year or next year. I don't know for sure. It could be another, let's see, four years, five years. I don't know how it could go much past that. But I do believe we're very close to the coming of Jesus Christ. Now this year... We've been going through some things that are just insane, unprecedented craziness in this world. They are locking people in their homes over nothing more than a common cold and telling people you can't leave COVID-19, coronavirus, and you're, you'll die, you'll die. And you're like, what? You mean I can't leave? What? Well, it's interesting. Under the Old Testament Passover, they were told to shelter in place, stay at home. And here we are today. And the Passover is coming. Today is the Passover, April 8th, 2020. And everyone in the world is told, stay in your home. That almost sounds like back there. Stay in your home. Prepare. Get ready. Get in your house. Why? Because death is coming. Well, what are we hearing today? Two, three days ago? I don't remember exactly, but I watched the, the news and I heard the president. And the president of the United States of America, you know what he said? He said, we're getting into the point now of the coronavirus where we'll see the peak amount of deaths, the most death, he said, from this virus. Death. <laughs> shelter in your homes. Death. Today, 2020, shelter in your homes. Death. It's uncanny to me to see, wow, that happened back there almost 3,500 years ago, and wow, over here we're seeing some of the same things. What is COVID-19? They're saying it's a plague. <laughs> 
plague, well, there were plagues in Egypt right before the Passover. Matter of fact, the death of that is the last plague. And it's like, wow, wow. And now we're just past the 70th anniversary of Israel. I don't know, was this the beginning of the 71st year or 72nd? I forget. But then you have what's called a pink moon. I was sitting in my desk here the other day, and I was opening my emails, and all of a sudden someone sent an email. Have you heard about the pink moon, Brother Breaker? And I go, the what now? <laughs> they said the pink moon. I said, the who? Here we are in 2020. And we're coming upon Passover. Well, actually, it's today. A lot of you will see this video after the Passover. And we're seeing so many correlations to the first Passover 3,500 years ago. Stay in your home. Shelter in home. Uh, watch out. The death is coming. Look out for COVID-19. Death, death, death. And then all of a sudden, somebody sends me this thing and says, Hey, Brother Breaker, have you heard about this? There's going to be a Passover, and there's going to be a pink moon. I said, What on earth is a pink moon? I've heard of a blue moon. I've heard of red moons. It's quite interesting that the red moons, why a lot of that has to do with the nation of Israel. You know, starting in 2014, 2015, 2016, and it's just amazing how Israel got their capital back. And Trump declared their, their capital as Jerusalem on the 70th anniversary of Israel. How, how weird is that? Well, they said, how about the Passover pink moon? Now, what I'll do is I'll put a picture in here. I have someone in Israel that sent me a picture. said, here, Brother Breaker, here's the pink moon. It's a very rare occurrence, a pink moon. And it happens to come on this day. <laughs> it's just like, I don't know. I just want to throw that in there. I thought that was interesting. But what happened back here? All that, and it's so weird how there's so many correlations to what we're seeing today at this Passover. All that back there was all preparation for the Exodus so that the people of God could leave that country and go to a better country, a better place. Are we that close to the rapture? Are we about to see our Exodus? Is the rapture coming? I hope so. I don't know, but I hope so. But I'm hoping the rapture comes soon. But if you know your Bible, now this is amazing, okay? There's just, there's got to be a point to where you go, no, that can't be a coincidence. Because there's so many coincidences taking place. And the other day, somebody sent me an email and said, Brother Breaker, did you hear about the earthquake? I said, what earthquake? Well, let me show you. <laughs> I'm going to draw a map up here, and I'm not good at maps. But if you know, um, you know, maps... Here's the Nile, okay, the Nile River in Egypt. Children of Israel left there, and they came across the Dead Sea, or the Red Sea, excuse me. This is the Red Sea. At the Exodus, they came across the Red Sea, and then they went up this way to the Promised Land. Here would be, I guess, the Dead Sea, and here's the Jordan River. So the a lot of your scholars, they say, well, they left here, and they went down here, and they went up here. Sorry, you're wrong. <laughs> the Bible says they crossed the Red Sea. you got to be very careful, these people that call themselves Bible scholars, because they don't even follow what the Bible says. The Bible tells us that at the Exodus, they crossed the Red Sea. But you look at many of your maps in the back of your Bible, you don't have the children of Israel crossing the Red Sea. This is the Red Sea, and it has two different places. One over here, and one over here. This over here is called the Gulf of Aquaba. This is called the Gulf of Aquaba. Alright? Now, a guy named Ron Wyatt, he went over there, and he found, right in this area, he found a land bridge. Super deep here, super deep there, but in the middle, it's not that deep. He says, boy, that'd be a great place to cross. So I don't go by the back of my Bible and the false map that it has, in which it has the children of Israel going, doop, and not crossing the Red Sea. My Bible says they crossed the Red Sea. And this guy, Ron Wyatt, went over there, and he dove down. Guess what he found? He found chariot wheels, gold chariot wheels from Egypt. So rather than follow the false Bible scholars, we follow the Bible, we follow the proof, and the Bible shows us that they came down like this, and then they went across that way. So they crossed the Red Sea here in the Gulf of Aquaba. Again, watch out for your so-called Bible scholars. Always check for yourself to see if they're telling you the truth. And I looked on YouTube, and I looked up uh, Exodus maps, uh, images. Many of them were the false map. They didn't show them crossing the Red Sea at all. you got to watch out for that. But, Jerusalem Post, April 5th, 2020. 4.3 earthquake takes place right where the Exodus took place. And the actual title is 4.3 Magnitude Earthquake Felt in Eilat. Eilat. Eilat is about right here. Eilat. I think I'm spelling it right. 
and there was a 4.3 earthquake. Three days before Passover. <laughs> just, just incredible that it just happened to take place, the epicenter, as close as you can get to where the exodus took place. Is that coincidence? Or is that God in heaven going, hey down there, I'm up here and I'm real. And I just want you all to think about what's going on. Earthquake takes place, look and see where it takes place. What's that remind you of? The exodus. <laughs> What's the coming up feast? Passover. <laughs> now, I'm not going to say the rapture's coming. I don't know. I hope it is. I mean, there's some people that are saying, Brother Brinker, we believe the rapture's going to be three days after Passover. And I go, okay. Uh, April 8th, 9th, 10th. So they're saying April 11th. And they're saying the Passover is coming, and then the Exodus. Oh, okay. Which, I don't know. I'm not saying it is. I'm not saying it right. probably won't. You know, most of the time, people are wrong. <laughs> but that would be interesting. 2020, you know, a lot of people talk about 2020 vision. <laughs> And what is 411? 411, information. <laughs> I don't know if the rapture will take place on 411. By the time you watch this, that date will probably have already passed. But wouldn't it be cool if it did? 411? Information, vision, vision of information. Hey, God is real in heaven. Look it down. But um, I don't know. I've always thought the rapture is going to have to take place, you know, around trumpets, Feast of Trumpets, you know, last trump or stuff like that. So maybe it could be this year. Maybe we're just waiting. But it's just very interesting to me to see how that Passover, or what it represents, or what it's talking about, and here we are in an unprecedented time in history in which on Passover time, our government tells us, nope, stay in your home, there's going to be death. Well, that's what was back there. And then they tell us, and the most amount of death, the highest amount of deaths are going to be right around this time. It's just, it's uncanny. And then you got an earthquake coming, and it reminds us of Exodus. Could be something, could be num nothing, but it sounds like a coincidence. And the more you read your Bible, the more you look at current events, the more coincidences we see. And to me, it just keeps pointing to our redemption draws nigh. If you're saved, you're saved by the blood of Christ, your soul is saved. What we're waiting for is the rapture, the redemption of the body. And those who have died in Christ already, well, their body will rise at the rapture. Their soul's in heaven, but their body's buried down here. We who are saved and alive and remain will be caught up and given a glorified body. So I want to encourage you to keep looking up, keep uh, waiting on the Lord, keep studying your Bible. Uh, several people told me, Brother Breaker, this, this lockdown is great. The government's telling us not to leave our houses, and they're like, this is wonderful. We have more time to read the Bible, and they're reading their Bibles more and more and more. I'd like to encourage you to read your Bible. If you're saved... I'd like to encourage you to witness to others and tell them how to be saved. If you're not saved, I'd like to encourage you. Come to Jesus Christ for salvation. He's the sacrifice for your sins. And the only way to be saved is through the blood of Jesus Christ. All right. God bless. Uh, thank you for watching. See you next time. Lord willing, if we're still here. Bye-bye. <laughs>